Hello and welcome to this talk in which we'll be looking at how different trading approaches and uh, trading strategies indeed manage to trade their way through different market phases and in particular more volatile market phases which we're calling the mayhem here. First of all, though, we will look at why we should use a more systematic or quantitative approach to the markets. And if you're not already a convert to that, hopefully I'll try and be able to persuade you that it is a good idea. Then we'll have a look at how we quantify different market regimes, how we quantify those more quiet periods versus these more volatile mayhem periods. And finally, we'll have a look at different trading approaches and how they perform through these more volatile periods. They either suffer the mayhem, they avoid the mayhem, or in some cases they can try and embrace the mayhem. Before we get going, just a quick disclaimer, nothing that you're about to see or hear is a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument. Trading and investing in the financial markets is a risky business and you should always consult a licensed financial advisor before deciding if any approach is right for you. So the objectives of this talk are really to try and, as I said, systematically identify those different market regimes and identify when we're entering one of those more uh, volatile periods or certainly adverse for the long side uh, stock market periods, uh, which I'm calling the mayhem here. We'll then have a look at just different approaches to try and uh, trade through those volatile times. And finally, we'll draw out some conclusions about which may be the optimal approaches. We will be trading a single instrument here, which is the ETF SPY, which represents the movements in the S&P 500. We will always be long only. Our time frame is the daily time frame, and the objective is to try and maximize our risk-adjusted returns in the examples that we'll see later. But firstly, why should we use a systematic approach? Well, if you head to the literature, you'll see diagrams such as this, which say to be a successful trader, you need a winning uh, approach or strategy. You need good risk management or position sizing methodology. And finally, you need uh, a healthy dose of trading psychology so that you can stick to the, that winning system and those risk management uh, parameters. And if you look at one book in particular, which was Van Tharp's early work called uh, Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom, a great book, uh, awful title. And uh, in this very early part of that book, he, he paints the picture uh, this way, saying that uh, about 60% of your success as a trader is down to having good positive psychology. About 30% of your success is due to good money management approaches. And your strategy is only worth about 10% of your success. Now, when I read this, I always thought it didn't sound quite right. And the more that uh, more experience I've got and the more research I've done, I actually disagree wholeheartedly with this. I mean, but what, basically what he's saying is that you can have a pretty crappy strategy or even a loss-making one, but as long as you've got good money management and positive psychology, you'll still be a success at trading. And uh, that just makes no sense at all. So I actually think the pie should look a little bit more like this, meaning your strategy, if you have a good, solid winning strategy that fix you, fits your objectives and meets with your lifestyle constraints, then add in a healthy dose of money management and trading psychology, this is, you're going to have a much better uh, chance at being a success in the trading world if you start off this way. Now, of course, if you've uh, watched enough of these things on YouTube and uh, gone to enough uh, presentations about trading, you've probably seen uh, pictures such as this or even in the, in the trading books themselves where they will show you a picture perfect example of a trading strategy and when it worked. And in this case, what they're saying is, well, you can you could have got in down here when the uh, red line crossed the blue line and then you hold and then you get out here when the uh, blue line crosses the red line. Now that's that's great. That's one perfect example, but that really tells us nothing about the trading strategy. It tells us doesn't tell us whether it's worked in the past, whether it might work in the future, does it work on other markets, does it work on other time frames and so on. And so the only way to uncover or answer those questions is to 
uh, try and quantify this idea by tr by looking at it across a very very large sample size because one of the problems as humans is that we're very good at recognizing patterns almost too good in a sense and that we will see things on the chart that may not actually uh, be there in uh, what well, they may not have any profitable outcome associated with them if we look at an example from outside the trading world this is a couple of uh, photographs from the surface of the planet Mars and you know I could uh, sit here until I'm blue in the face and tell you that these are nothing more than random rock formations on the surface of another planet a planet that no human beings ever visited but the pattern recognition part of your brain is so strong that it won't let you believe anything other than what you're seeing up here is uh, human faces and if you visit some of the more kookier parts of the internet, uh, you'll, uh, they'll try and persuade you that uh, ancient humans went up in bamboo rockets and uh, carved these into the rock on Mars. And of course, that that's, uh, just uh, doesn't make sense at all. Uh, but the, the point is that we're very good at recognizing patterns. And don't get me wrong, pattern, being able to recognize patterns allows us to live uh, a normal life. You wouldn't be able to drive your car down the road or, or do your shopping at the supermarket if you weren't able to recognize patterns the only trouble is when we get to something like the financial markets which are a very noisy environment we may start to see things that uh, didn't really exist uh, here's one more just for fun this was one that was taken also from Mars a few years back when the cameras weren't all that great and they sent a, uh, an HD camera up a little while ago and took another picture of the same object and uh, would you believe it? It uh, doesn't suddenly look as uh, convincing as it did in the in the first picture. So if we go to try and develop a trading strategy, we the first thing that we try and do is to try and uncover some pattern that's in the markets. Now here's an example from uh, outside the trading world again, but if we consider a, a series of coin tosses, uh, the results of the coin tosses. Here we've got T for tails, H for heads. And if we stare at this pattern long enough, we may actually see something to emerge, which is that every even numbered flip actually ended up being a head uh, all except for one. So we may think, well, hold on, we may have discovered something in here. Here's a pattern that we could probably trade. So if we wanted to trade this little game or develop a system to play this game forward, we could come up with a rule that we would bet on uh, heads on every even numbered flip and look lo and behold that would have got us an 80 percent win rate in that series so let's uh, let's trade this forward then so here's the series continuing on coin 11 it flips we we don't bet on that so we don't care about the result but here comes coin 12 an even numbered coin and we're going to push all our chips in and bet everything on it being a head now the question is what is the probability that that coin is going to turn up ahead is it really 80 percent i think you'll agree it's probably a lot less than that in fact it's uh, it's very close to 50 percent indeed and so what we've done there is we've we've made some classical errors when we've come to develop our little trading strategy that have tripped us up when we've come to trade it forward and our our, our results or our future results are going to look nothing like our past results so some common errors that can uh, that you can come up against when developing strategies are things like using too small a sample size so looking at uh, a window of price action that's just too small or maybe you know two months two years or something you really need a, a large sample size as possible uh, curve fitting so what we did there is we just picked out the the results that we wanted we didn't uh, try and look at other uh, aspects of the data and we didn't we there was no way to validate the results we didn't have any additional data that we could try our system on against we just jumped straight into live trading and that's a trap as well systems themselves can be lucky obviously you can you know uh, buying breakouts in a bull market will work very good but when it hits a, a bear market not so good so you have to be able to try and figure out if the system just got lucky because of the market conditions and you know in this case we we fell into the trap of believing that believing the results that are too good you know if you see a strategy that um, that claims to make 100 percent per annum then that's that's generally going to be way too good um, 
to to be true and so you know an 80 percent win rate on a series of coin tosses is also too good to be true and the last one there is the 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 key one that we found predictive signals where none exist the coin coin doesn't have any memory of what the last throw or the throw before that was so it really doesn't have any memory about what the next um, outcome may be so again make sure that uh, your uh, signals really do have predictive value so the question is, is there predictive uh, value in the financial markets? Here's a chart we can look at and we can draw some lines on this chart and we can say things like, you know, here's a here's a failed uh, swing high. We've got a bear market here, then uh, sort of puts in a bottom there, makes a higher low, some consolidation in here, stair step rise of a, a bull market, triple top or hidden shoulders, and then uh, a decline and then uh, collapse into the into the end there. Now, you could you could look at this chart and you could probably uh, make an educated guess about what's going to happen at the right hand edge here is it going to go up or is it going to go down and whichever you think I can tell you you're wrong <laughs> and the reason for that is that this is completely random data I generated this using a simulated coin toss if the coin came up heads the uh, next bar went up and if the coin toss came out tails the next bar went down I did that for a whole series and the amazing thing as you can see is that this chart looks uncannily like a price chart in the financial markets. Even randomly generated data can have these patterns in it such as trends, consolidation theories, higher highs, higher lows, all as the result of just randomness. There's actually no predictive value. The next bar at the end here could be up, could be down. It's a 50-50 chance because it's generated as part of the result of a coin toss. So again, the question is, uh, is, are the financial markets all just noise or is there any predictive signal in there that we can use? And one way to answer that is to look at the distribution of uh, daily percentage changes in the S&P 500. So this is a 55 year period and the takeaway from this chart, I'll just explain what's going on here. The x-axis here shows the daily return from one day to the next, um, you know, below zero, above zero in percentage terms. And the vertical axis is the number of days that, that had the values in that bucket. So, um, so you can see that most results are pretty much close to zero. So, the, you know, the market either went up a little bit or went down a little bit. And in fact, almost all the results are contained in this kind of plus two to minus two or plus three to minus three percent uh, zone. And so all of that really is just random. There's absolutely no predictive value by saying, okay, the market was down today, so my guess is the market is going to be either up or down tomorrow. There's you just there's just no edge there at all. And in fact, I encourage you to, to try it. You know, make a prediction about what you think the market is going to close down or up tomorrow. And then tomorrow, record your result, whether you're right or wrong, and then do that for a series of uh, six or eight weeks. And uh, I can pretty much guarantee that your results will land somewhere at about 50-50, uh, meaning that each outcome from day to day is a coin toss. So does that may mean that our uh, quest to develop a strategy as traders is, is futile? Well, it is largely futile because this is mostly noise, almost all noise. The, the one saving grace or the couple of saving graces we've got are the, the peak of this um, the, the peak of this distribution is actually just slightly to the right of zero, meaning that on average, the day, the next day will be higher or rather than lower for the S&P 500 over a very, very long period of time. So that's something that we can use to, to try and capture uh, a very long term uh, look over maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years. The other thing we can look at is that these small blips out in the uh, the very long tails of this distribution are giving us indications that uh, there may be some reversion back towards the, the center. So reversion to the mean is a well-known effect in statistics and it's no different in the financial markets. If we have a, a day that prints a minus 7% drop from close to close, then there's a high probability 
let's call it 70% or so, that the next day will be a higher close. So we can use this information of these really outlier uh, results to try and generate a strategy based on that. So just before we get into the, the strategy stuff, here's a quick uh, matrix which I find help, helpful about how our skill and luck in trading uh, interact. So we, if we have a if we have a trading strategy and it gives us a signal, we well we've got we've got two um, things that we can do. We can either follow the signal, which is taking a, a making a correct decision about the uh, about what to do, and either buying or selling or telling uh, doing whatever it's asking us to do, or we can do something else, which would be the wrong decision. We can either ignore the signal, or we can double up, or we can go against uh, in the other direction, something of that nature. Now, if we if we take the correct approach, take the signal, and we make a profit, well, well that's we, that's a skillful profit. We've used our skill as strategy developers and traders to generate income, a skillful profit. If we make the uh, if we sorry if we make it, again if we take the correct decision but it results in a loss, well, that's just unlucky because no strategy wins 100% of the time, so you will get unlucky losses along the way. If we decide to do something else, make a wrong decision, and we still make money, well, that's just lucky. That's luck. We, we made a, a lucky profit in that particular instance. But if we take the wrong decision and we make a loss, well, that's just stupid. You know, we, we should be following our uh, strategy. We shouldn't be uh, doing something else. Now, what's interesting is that over time, your unlucky losses and your lucky wins will tend to even each other out, which means that your P&L will end up being the deficit uh, the difference I should say between your skillful profits and your stupid losses so our job as traders is really to try and maximize the top row of this decision uh, matrix and in particular this uh, top left hand quadrant if we can so just to summarize that, why would we want to use a systematic approach? Well, it gives us a, a, a methodology to test whether any particular trading idea has worked in the past or whether it might work in the future. It allows us to back test, forward test and validate our trading ideas. We can uh, do things like tailor the system to our own objective by uh, tuning the parameters. So if we find a strategy that has too big a drawdown, we can tune our parameters and uh, try and contain that uh, drawdown to somewhere within our own risk profile. It allows us to uh, build confidence in an idea before we start trading. If you know what the win rate is and the max number of consec losses and things like that, then you've got much better chance of being able to stick with a trading strategy, particularly through the bad times as well as good. You can also compare strategies one to the other. So if you have two different types of strategies, it might be difficult to compare them, uh, their individual metrics, but we can use risk adjusted returns, for example, to figure out which one is going to give us the best bang for our buck. And once we're trading a strategy, we can uh, monitor its ongoing results by uh, measuring the short term performance against its long term metrics. And finally, it's the future. You know, your competition is not uh, other retail traders around. It's the financial institutions and the large players that are in the market. And you can bet your bottom dollar that the, the you know the investment banks and the invest uh, the insti institutional players are not all sitting around a desk poring over a chart and drawing lines and wondering wondering whether you know that this head and shoulders uh, neckline is going to break, for example. Uh, no, if you go into a trading floor of a, a, a large uh, institution nowadays. You'll find it's a very quiet environment, lots of people tapping away uh, on uh, keyboards and uh, most of it is uh, quant driven. And, you know, th those those quant strategies then go into banks and banks of machines, which are just basically trolling the market all the time, looking for edge and in a sense, eroding the edge uh, and making it harder for us because, you know, when they buy, it's then more difficult for us to buy at the same price. So. It really is the future, and if we want to try and have any chance of um, of competing in that playing field, then we really need to adopt a quantitative approach. Okay, so what makes a good trading strategy? Well, I'm sure you probably agree with the first one here, that we always want to find something that makes lots of money, but that really doesn't 
tell us whether we'll actually be able to achieve that because I could show you two trading strategies. Trading strategy A makes 20%, trading strategy B makes 20%. However, trading strategy A took a 50% drawdown in its first year. Trading strategy B has only ever had a 10% drawdown. Which of those two would you rather trade? So it, we really need to know, understand more about the journey of the trading strategy rather than just uh, how much net profit it generates. So some things we can look at are things like trade frequency. You know, a few of us would find it uh, easy to trade a strategy that, that takes, you know, 50,000 trades a year or even one that only takes five trades a year. Most of us like some action, but not too much action. What sort of holding period do you like? Are you somebody who just likes to hold for a few minutes or a couple of hours? Or are you happy to hold for days or weeks or months on end? Where do you sit on that continuum? continuum. What sort of win-loss ratio would suit you best? Are you someone who uh, can tr happily trade with a 20-25% win rate or do you somebody that prefers more like a 65 or 70% win rate? Uh, return to drawdown ratio begins to give us some understanding of the, the path and the volatility of the returns. You know, that's a very crude mechanism of saying how much return am I making for the amount of drawdown I've got to endure. Uh, things like smooth, consistent returns can be found with things like ulcer ratio, uh, sharp ratio, K ratio, and so on, which gives us, again, some understanding about how smooth it's going to be on this journey. But I think one thing that we can all agree on is that what we want to find is something that meets our objectives, fits with our personality and lifestyle, so that it's something that we'll be able to trade good times and bad, and it will generate the, um, the outcomes that we want. So that's what we're going to try and do now, is going to try and find something that meets that, uh, that category. But before we do, we first need to figure out how we quantify these different market regimes. How do we quantify these mayhem periods versus more, these more quiet periods? So if we look at something like a long-term chart of the S&P 500, the, the thing that really sticks out is, uh, well, there's a few things actually. One is is that these trends tend to persist. You know, when, when the market is in, uh, say, a long-term uptrend, for example, the uptrend will tend to keep going. If the market gets into these more steep drawdown periods, then again, the market will tend to keep moving lower until it doesn't. And the other thing is that these uptrend periods tend to be less volatile. You can see they have this kind of stair step uh, motion to them, whereas these uh, bear market periods have these more uh, impulsive, um, you know, collapse events. So uh, the, the so-called fire in the nightclub effect where everybody just wants out. And nobody cares the price that they get, just get me out at any price. And that, that leads to this sharp collapse in the price. Whereas on the upside, then the the mechanism here is, again, human nature, but it's that no nobody really wants to pay too much more than the last guy paid. So you get these little creeping increments as the market moves higher. And so what we want to find is the how we can classify these two different periods and so that we can know how to approach them with our trading strategies. So we can see that, you know, when the when the direction is up, the volatility tends to be lower. When the direction is lower, the volatility tends to be higher. So we can now begin to categorize that. So our uptrend periods tend to be lower in volatility, our downtrend periods tend to be higher volatility. So by looking at these two market characteristics, trend and volatility, we can begin to uh, generate some quantitative measurements of these so that we can use them uh, in our trading approaches. And what's interesting, as we've just found out with trend and volatility, is they have a, an inverse relationship. Um, so when the trend is more bullish, the volatility tends to fall. When the trend is more ba bearish, the, the volatility tends to rise. And this period, this this uh, section in here, if you like, the, the bearish, more volatile periods are what we're calling uh, the mayhem for the purposes of this talk. And so now we'll have a look at some uh, ways that we can quantify these different uh, market regimes. In terms of direction, the most uh, obvious one is a moving average. You can see what I've done here is put a moving average through the price. And when the price is above the moving average, that, that's 
painted this green section when it's below the moving average that's painted this pink section so you can see that in general when the uh, when the market is moving higher then it's it tends to be more green so that's what we want whereas the market is moving lower it tends to be more pink which is uh, you know again what we want we want to be able to determine those two different types uh, what's interesting is that you can see a lot of false positive results here where the, the price is sliced through the moving average but then reverted and continued on in the same direction so so that's going to give us some choppy results now you could resolve that by adding a second moving average and making it one moving average versus the other but for our purposes will just you be using price and the moving average another one you can use is what's called rate of change which is the percentage change in price over a given period and here in this bottom pane here we have added some smoothing to it so that it's now a smooth rate of change and the center line here is just the zero line so if the rate of change is, ab is above the the zero line that tells us the market has been going up and so we can classify that as these bullish periods and when the rate of change is below the zero line that tells us the market has been falling and so we can categorize that as these bearish periods so you can see that the the, the color bands here are more contiguous so that will give us less turnover when we come to develop a strategy using it turning to more uh, looking how we can measure volatility a couple of ways uh, first of all is uh, average true range so the average true range the easiest way to think of that is it's just the the height of a bar there's a little bit more to it than that but the idea is that when you know through the bear market times the bar sizes get taller and through the bull market times the, the bar sizes get uh, smaller so here I've turned it into a percentage by just dividing it by a moving average and the uh, what you can see here is that uh, here's the the, this, the black line here is at 1.5 percent so if the market is moving on average more than 1.5 percent per day then that is we're going to classify as that as our bear market periods and if the market is moving less than 1.5% uh, uh, per day, then that's that's going to classify that as the uh, bull market periods. And then lastly, on the volatility, we'll be looking at the volatility index, which is the the VIX, which uh, and I'm not uh, you've you've heard of, but it uh, measures the. Uh, the estimated implied volatility of S&P 500 options over the next 30 days. So options are used as portfolio insurance by fund managers and meaning that if the, when the market falls, the option price goes up, their stock prices go down and so that, that allows them to manage their risk. So we can use that to indicate when these bear market periods come in, they, when the demand for these options goes up that pushes the price of the options up or pushes the implied volatility up which pushes the price up and that uh, pushes the VIX up and so here above this uh, about 22 we can see we're, we're classifying that as the, the bear market and below 22 but the bull market so the VIX tends to move in those bands where you get sort of from uh, let's call it 0 to 22 or low 20s let's call it and then from low 20s to about 40 is your more elevated risk and then above 40 is is kind of the you know these these wacky times such as the financial crisis there are other ways to do this you could use something like a long period RSI things like MACD even you know something that's uh, intermarket such as the yield curve you could use market breadth, you know, the percentage of stocks in an index above their 200 day moving average, for example, which tends to drop during bear market periods and other things such as the advanced decline line. So if you if if this is an area of research that appeals to you, then you should really try and cast the net as wide as possible until you find something that, that works the best for you. Okay, so let's have a look now at uh, some different trading approaches that we can use. Um, and the, the way that we're going to classify these trading approaches is basically how the market allows traders to make money at all. And the reason that we can make money in the market is because the market is a less than perfect uh, or less than totally efficient uh, method of uh, pricing financial assets. And what's interesting is that the market is inefficient in some quite 
uh, key ways uh, that allow us to take a position. I mean, if the market was completely efficient at uh, pricing assets, we wouldn't be able to make money at all because the price would jump from one price to another so quick that you can get in there and make a trade. But as we know, the financial market prices unfold on a more slowly basis. So if we can identify an opportunity, get in, take a profit and then exit over that period of time that allows us to make money. So the three different in market inefficiencies we'll be looking at are the risk premium uh, inefficiency, which, which is where the uh, market will pay you a premium for holding risk in it for a long period of time. So you hold market risk, the market, the stock market in this case will uh, pay you a premium for doing that. Uh, the momentum inefficiency is basically will tr uh, trends persist. So once a market is in a, an uptrend or a downtrend, that trend will tend to persist. And then f finally, mean reversion is that more sawtooth action that you see within the trend, where the you know the price will make excursions to outlying zones above or below some average, and then they will bounce back in towards the the average. And so to, uh, we, you have to use different strategies to take advantage of these different market inefficiencies. Something like risk premium can be got by just buying and holding the market because you want to uh, generate return over the very, very long term and be less concerned with the market risk in the shorter term. Momentum can be got to by uh, using a trend following approach. So uh, identifying trends, uh, getting on them both up or down up and up and up only in our case because we're long only uh, and then when the trend is over then you exit and move to the sidelines again and mean reversion finally is where we would use much more of a swing trading approach where we identify these extreme lows or extreme highs in the range of pricing and then we make a bet that the market will reverse back towards the average in the uh, short term so how these strategies trade through more volatile times is is the where what we're really interested in because if you're trading a buy and hold approach well you really have to suffer the volatility you suffer the mayhem there's no uh, there's no choice if you want to get those uh, longer term gains you have to allow your account to ride the ups and downs of the market and carry that market risk for a trend following approach if we think about long only trend following approaches, if you're trading a basket of stocks, say what you'll tend to find is when the market goes into a bear period that there just won't be opportunity. There won't be much good, uh, many stocks do, uh, making an uptrend. And so your strategy will tend to move to the sidelines. And that's what I'm calling avoiding the mayhem at all. And then lastly, your swing trading uh, strategy, well, they actually, actually quite likes volatility. It's actually what's called a short vol approach, which means that when the volatility expands, you take the uh, position in the opposite direction, betting that volatility will contract and that that usually means that price will rise at the same time. And so you can trade some of these strategies through most market conditions. And that's what I'm calling uh, embracing the mayhem. So let's firstly have a look at buy and hold. What the hell is it? Well, it's basically just buying and holding and that's, there's nothing more to it than that. We buy our full position at the start of our period and then we hold to our end of our period. And, uh, and you know, in, in the course of real life, of course, the end of your period may be when you retire or when you die or, or at some other point, but you really have to hold for the very, very long term to take advantage of this um, strategy. So it does have some advantages. It's very much set and forget. You just uh, you stick it in the market and then you do your best to try and ignore it until you, until you need the money out at the end. And the proponents will always tell you that time in the market always beats timing the market. It does have a very high prob probability of positive returns over the long term. And the long term here means, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. And one way we can uh, look at that is to look at uh, the the length of time that you invest versus the uh, the probability of making money versus losing money. So you can see in this chart here, if we hold for one month, we've only got maybe a 62% chance of making money, 38% chance of losing money. And the longer we hold, that probability of making money increases to when if we hold for 15 years, we're virtually certain to have made a return over that 15 year period. 
On the downside, we are obviously carrying a lot of market risk in order to try and achieve that uh, return. And some of those drawdowns, as we saw, such as through the financial crisis, can be quite eye-watering. You know, in in the region of uh, 50 or 60 percent drawdown uh, is a lot uh, to sit your uh, sit and watch your account go through. And there is obviously the uh, the question of opportunity cost. You know, could you be deploying your capital in some uh, slightly more clever way, if you like, or to, or to, or even using it in in some other opportunities, such as proper, property development, for example. So, if you buy and hold an index like the ET, the SPY ETF, it's going to look very much like this chart, which is a chart of the index itself. Uh, it's going to look uh, very very similar because SPY has very small costs and. Uh, it just basically follows the index. So you can see you're going to have to sit through these big drawdowns and uh, you know these other little bumps and humps along the way. Uh, if we run it through a back test, we can see that the here we've got the green and orange section is your equity, the black line is the index. So of course it's a it's a match. Uh, well, it's, you know it's just slightly less after costs, and the uh, drawdown period down here as well. You can see how that maxed out through that 2008 period, but your total return would be 168 percent, which is not to be sniffed at. Uh, giving you a return of about 7% per annum, which is about what you would expect for uh, S&P returns over the long term. But there's the the uh, the there's the, the the fly in the ointment, which is that 57% drawdown that had to be suffered or endured through 2008. And the metric that we'll be using to measure risk-adjusted returns throughout these examples will be a compound annual return divided by maximum uh, drawdown, which is, as I've said already, it's a crude metric, but it will serve our purposes quite well. And it's 0 0.12 there, you can see for this strategy. However, it did have a 100% win rate. <laughs> we made one trade and it was a winner. So uh, that's something to like. Now, obviously, the uh, the difficulty or the problem with this approach is this big fat drawdown here. That, now, you might think, well, 2008 was a one off. I might not see another one of those in my lifetime, and and that's that's certain that that that's an argument you could uh, you could mount for sure. But um, one way you can mitigate against this risk is to is to buy and hold two separate instruments rather than one. So one popular strategy is to hold the so-called 60-40 portfolio, which is 60% in the index and 10% in something like the 10-year the bonds. And the idea here is that the the bonds tend to have a, an inverse relationship with the stock market, uh, but it's not perfect. It's certainly not a minus one correlation as you can see there there are periods through here through the the mid uh, 20-teens where the both the bonds and the stocks went up but if you take a look at these more volatile periods through 2008 the bonds certainly did move up quite rapidly as the market stock market fell uh, fell away so so that would certainly mitigate the downside risk now obviously the bonds uh, are not as juicy as the stock market is, so you are paying away uh, some of that return in order to try and manage the risk. So let's see what how that performs. So here you can see, well, the, this, the first thing to look at is the drawdown is now less than half. In fact, it's almost a third of the um, outright index holding at just 20%. Our total return is 88%, so more or less half what we would have uh, got from just holding the, uh, the index itself, 4% return. But the return to drawdown ratio is almost double 0.21 versus 0.12 as it was before so that's that's really telling us that this is twice as good in terms of bang for buck and even though it didn't uh, reach as high heights in terms of its return it's still a better bang for your buck and the way to think about that is if I levered the strategy up three times to get close to that 60% drawdown, then my return here would be three times as big, not twice as big as it was in the other strategy. If we look at them side by side, you can see the difference here, uh, how, you know, this three times 88 is is about 1.5 times that uh, 168. So, um so definitely this one is better bang for your buck, but this one, if you can withstand the drawdown uh, with unleveraged, it will give you a better outright return. So moving on to a trend following approach. So what's what's trend following all about? Well, 
what we're looking for is we're looking for trends in the market and we're going to look for the market rising and then we're going to enter and hold and then we're going to uh, wait for the market to roll over and we're going to sell and go to cash at that point and we're just going to rinse and repeat. Some advantages of trend following, well, it can produce some quite big winning trades and you can end up with profit ratios in the range of uh, two and a half, three, three and a half uh, times, meaning your winners are three times as big as your losers on average. It tends to have quite low turnover. So if we think about a stock trading strategy or even one based in the stock market, we're going to find very few trades in general because the market doesn't go from bullish to bearish all that often. So that means it's a low time commitment in terms of placing orders. They can have long holding periods, which is uh, to be liked but, um, if, you, if you're somebody that likes just sitting in the market. So you've always got exposure a lot of the time, at least when the market's trending in your direction. And as I've said there, it does do, do very well in trending markets. Some drawbacks, of course, well, the win rate tends to only be about 50% at best, meaning half your trades are going to be losers. But the, the fact that um, the winners are bigger than the losers on average is what makes the, uh, this trade make money. They can go to, into drawdown for long periods of time and only make new equity highs very infrequently. So you have to expect volatility in your returns and that's really because of that third point there which is you're carrying a lot of market risk by your capital having to ride the ups and downs uh, in, in, you know within the trend at least even if you're trying to avoid those uh, bigger downs that come after the trend is finished and obviously as the market erupts uh, and mayhem ensues then you have to take action and move to the sidelines. So firstly, we'll look at a strategy based on our moving average here, which is we're going to be long above the moving average and flat below it. So um, how does that look when we run it through the back tester? I think the first thing you're going to be able to see is that, you know, we had lots of trades where we bought and sold in here where the, and that might actually work against us. So let's run that through the back tester anyway. So we can see the total return is about 79%, 4% per annum, uh, but did take a 23% drawdown. So it just got pinged a little bit here towards the end of the 2008 period or even into 2009, giving us a return to drawdown ratio of 0.17 and a very poor win rate and lots of trades. And that, that speaks to that, that noisiness of the interaction between price and that moving average. So. Uh, this is really a candidate for, for trying to smooth that out, maybe with a second moving average, for example. But it gives us a bench uh, mark, at least, to, to work with. Next one we'll look at is using the rate of change. So here we're going to go long when our rate of change is above zero, and we're going to go flat when the rate of change falls below that zero line. So let's, that's a very easy one to understand. Let's see how it works. So in the uh, outcomes, we've got, it's a, as you can see, a much uh, higher return, 149% for only a 20% drawdown through that uh, period. And you can see how it's got those flat spots on it where it's out of the market because the market's not trending. Uh, a 75% win rate, which is very nice. Uh, that was probably more luck than judgment. Um, given that these are, um, you know, trending strategies, which probably over the longer term, uh, you know, much longer term than this period here, you would expect to sort of even out about 50%, but only eight trades. So much uh, less turnovers than the uh, price versus the moving average strategy. Next up is the average true range indicator and what we're going to do here is we're going to be long when the average true range is below that 1.5 percent per day on average and we're going to go flat when it when it shoots above that 1.5 percent per day on average level run that through the back tester and that gives us uh, this result here 137 percent uh, return which is uh, nice uh, 90 percent drawdown so about the same as the previous uh, strategy we looked at again you can see those flat spots on the equity line uh, it, it took six trades and uh, had 100 percent win rate which i'm a little bit suspicious about but again that's probably just a result of luck and it had 0.31 return to drawdown ratio
Next up is the volatility index strategy. And what we're going to do here is we're going to be long the market when the VIX is below 22 and we're going to be flat the market when the VIX goes above 22. So let's see how that does. Here you can see the results, about 7% per arm. This one actually beats the index, which is interesting. So you can see the, the equity, line, equity number is just above the index number there. But it did take a huge 43% drawdown. So not quite as bad as buy and hold, but it did uh, take a big drawdown through that period. So this uh, does illustrate quite nicely that the in order to get these larger returns, you do have to take more risk. So wherever there's a big return, there is usually big risk. Uh, the opposite is not true, though. It doesn't mean that if you always take big risk, risk you're going to get big return. I'm afraid that risk can survive quite happily on its own without any return. But uh, certainly from the return side, there is that positive relationship. Uh, four trades with a 75% win rate and a return to drawdown ratio of 0.16. So let's have a look at those results side by side. And we can see if we look at this car MDD column, that's our uh, master metric, if you like, that's our risk adjusted return. So you can see it's actually a tie uh, between these uh, two, the rate of change and the average true range, both, both giving that 0.31. Uh, if it was me and I could only trade one and I had to choose between them, then I'd choose the one with the fewer trades because uh, fewer trades to get the same bang for your buck is always going to be better because the um, uh, because the the fewer times you have to interact with the market, the better. It's uh, lower commission costs, friction costs, you know, spread, uh, slippage, and uh, human error are always involved, are always there, or thereabouts when you uh, when you buy or sell in the market. So fewer trades for the same bang for your buck is is the way I would go, which means I guess average true range is uh, slightly better than the rest. And finally, we'll look at uh, mean reversion. So what the hell is mean reversion? Well, I think the an analogy here is a, is a rubber band. If I take a rubber band and, and stretch it as far as it goes and then stretch it a little bit more and then let it go, that rubber band is going to ping back to uh, not only back to where it started, but it's going to uh, career through and uh, head in the other direction as well. And so that's what we're going to look for is we're going to look for those extremes of extremes lows. We're going to buy them and then we're going to hold until the, um, the price moves to some extreme high. Here's an example of uh, some uh, points that we might like to try and identify. You can see here where uh, this blue area here, the blue shaded area is uh, what's called Bollinger Bands. If uh, you're not familiar with them, they're basically standard deviation lines, two, de two standard deviations either side of uh, an average, which in this case is the 20 period daily moving average. And you can see that when price moves towards the bottom end of that band, it often bounces and not only goes back to the average, but through it and over to the other side. And so we'll try and find those high points where we can get out. And so you can see that, you know, these entries are basically carrying very little risk because they're um, they're getting in at the low of the swing. And so your market risk with this type of approach is going to be uh, far less because of that higher accuracy entry. So how do you find price extremes and mean reversion? Well, here's a few ideas. Uh, you can use Bollinger Bands, as we've just seen. We can use something like an RSI, which is a, an oscillating indicator, or we can just count the uh, the lowest number of days since the, the previous lowest low or highest high and use that as a, as a mechanism. So re mean reversion tends to have quite high win rates and short holding periods and so both of those things uh, well what the short holding period certainly means that you've got less market risk but and the the high win rate is is generated from that high accuracy entry and because they they are really uh, market ag or market regime agnostic let's call it uh, you can trade them through uh, volatile markets as well on the downside, they do tend to be higher turnover. You'll get more signals and you kind of need more signals because as we'll see in, uh, in a moment, the, the expectancy per trade can be quite small. So you might only be chasing one or 2% per time, which means that you have to generate a lot of those one or 2% to, um, to you know, make, it, make it worthwhile. 
So first strategy we're going to look at is we're going to use the Bollinger Bands. Um, now I've, I've uh, contracted them slightly here to make them fit, uh, to make them a little bit more f uh, fast acting to towards the price. So we've got four period moving average and 1.5 standard deviations on them. And we're going to wait for the price to close outside of the lower band t twice in a row. So uh, it's at, at an extreme and then we're going to wait for it to um be a second extreme and then we're going to buy that close and then we're going to sell on the first uh, close above the top band so here's what that looks like and the first thing you can see is that the 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 equity is a much smoother journey it's uh, much less likely to those uh, ups and downs that we saw with some of those trend following or uh, buy and hold strategies that we've seen already the other thing is that while it does make drawdown the drawdowns are very fast to recover and you're back at equity highs almost all the time with that said there are these uh, periods where it was doing nothing there were just not enough volatility in the market um, for it to to take action but by the same token, 2008, when it was very, very volatile, was when it did some of its um, best work. So 94%, which gives you a 5% return for a 9% drawdown. And the uh, car to max DD was 0.51. So it's now starting to look like uh, much more impressive figures than we've seen before. The win rate, 85%. So eight or nine of every 10 trades is uh, going to be a winner on average, which is, you know, most people would like and uh, did 26 trades over that period. So, you know, reasonable amount. Next one up is the RSI. So here we're going to uh, use the RSI and we're going to use a very fast moving RSI, the RSI 2, and we're going to wait for it to get below 8 and we're going to wait for it to stay below 8 for a, a second bar in a row. We're going to buy that close and then we're going to sell in the first close when the RSI scoots up above 87. Here's what that one looks like. Again, it's a smooth outcome in the in the equity. Uh, not too much drawdown and fast recoveries from the drawdown as well. A little bit more lumpy through that 2008 period than the uh, Bollinger Band strategy, but um, not too bad nonetheless. 5% return for a 90% drawdown, giving us a 0.27 and a 79% win rate. So 80%, 8 out of 10 of your trades on average uh, would have been winners. And then finally to the lowest low versus the highest high strategy. So here we're going to buy the lowest close in the previous 12 bars. So you, the market is, is seriously down. It's been going down and down and down. Uh, and it's so much so that this is the lowest close in the previous 12 bars. And then we're going to buy that close and we're going to sell when uh, the market reaches the highest close in the previous three bars. So for these, all these mean reverse strategies, you want to uh, wait and wait and wait for the optimal entry. But on the exit, we actually want to be quite quick because the market can easily roll over and that would obviously impact our win rate and our drawdowns, etc. So we want to be trying quick with those exits, giving us a high win rate, but a small expectancy per trade. Here's what that one looks like over the period. 4% return for a 20% drawdown, giving us a 0.22 on the car to MDD. 69, so again, that high win rate of trades. But this one was very busy, 198 trades. Did very well for the most part, just starts tailing off towards the end of the, the chart there, as you can see. So looking at those results, we have... Uh, you know, all of them given very nice win rates, all of them given reasonable amounts of drawdown. The Bollinger Band one in this case uh, did, did the best, um, but given that large 0.51 uh, return to drawdown ratio. And if we have a look at some examples, just to show you how these mean revert strategies can trade through, you know, different market regimes. Here's a sort of sideways market. Uh, one close outside the Bollinger Band, second close outside the Bollinger Band. We buy that close. That was the lowest close of the move, uh, except it did take a little bit of drawdown down here. And finally, closed above the top Bollinger Band, and we got it there. So a winning trade with a little bit of intra-trade drawdown. Here it is in a falling market. So the market's been coming down, lower highs, lower lows. One close outside the Bollinger Band, second close, we buy that one. Or more or less the low of the move there's only one lower close and then gets out here on the uptrend and then the market continues lower so we're you know even in a falling market we've managed to pick out a winning trade on the long side 
on the uh, the extreme fall. So this this is actually the end of the financial crisis, and uh, this little strategy managed to pick up the the very low of the move, and then. Um, uh, got out there uh, on that um, first move higher, as it were, uh, which was, uh, I think, more or less the end of the bear market. There might have been one more low into March, but uh, but that was a, a nice trade in a down market. And in a uh, uptrending market, higher highs, higher lows, here it got the low of the swing. And the benefit of having the, the wind in your back, as it were, is that the exit can obviously can often be a little bit more lucrative uh, because it uh, uh, the market will push the, the market higher in order, and you'll get a better uh, exit. So your expectancy will be a bit better when the trade is when the trend is, is with you versus when it's not. And here's a losing trade, so a little bit unlucky. Just got you know one close outside, two close outside. Bought that one, but the market kept falling, and it had to wait all the way to here. So yes, it was a losing trade, but the takeaway, I guess, is that there's no stop in this system. So you wouldn't, you know, if if you had got out on a stop down here, you would have had a much worse outcome than waiting for the uh, profit target up here. Okay, so let's look at those things side by side, the three different approaches, the mean reversion approach, which certainly has the best uh, bang for your buck and uh, a good win rate, but the average true range um, did come out quite nicely at 0.31 and buy and hold, which uh, has uh, the index bonds one certainly had a nice um, uh, drawdown level, although it didn't do quite well on the return side as the average true rain one. So now this is not to say that one of these or the others are uh, any better or that you should only trade one style. In fact, I think that you, um, as traders, we should try and uh, combine these approaches and, and use uh, different styles. And, and one reason for that, if we think about momentum and mean reversion for, for the two extremes, if you like, is that they have quite different um, uh, outcomes. On the momentum side, you're chasing a large expectancy per trade. That means you have to have a longer holding period and you're carrying more market risk, which means you have a lower win rate and less opportunity. But on the mean reversion side, you're actually you've got lots more opportunity, the higher turnover of trades. You generally have a high accuracy of entry, so your win rate tends to be higher. You're carrying hardly any market risk. Your holding period is smaller, but your expectancy is also smaller. So by trading, you know, multiple styles together, you actually end up having an overall smoothing effect on your uh, your own uh, outcomes in terms of your account's equity. So to wrap up, we can see that, you know, trying to find strategies that can trade through these more volatile conditions and embrace that mayhem, it does have some advantages because you might find that your trend following strategy is out of the market for a particular period. So this uh, takes up the, the slack, as it were. You do have to find the right approaches for the right market conditions. And as we've seen, Mean reversion strategies can offer good risk adjusted returns with still with having those low, low drawdowns, but really a, cam a combination of strategy types, I think will provide the, the best uh, balanced approach for uh, trading your way through the markets. So as we've seen, a systematic approach does have lots of different uh, advantages in that we can, you know, take a trading idea and look at it and assess it from all different angles before we decide we want to trade it. And just remember, the ideas I've shown here are, are really just ideas. They have they have the benefit of hindsight built into them, and so they're they're really not uh, indicative of of returns that may be uh, achieved out into the future. But by all means, use them uh, as in your own research. Uh, but certainly, don't trade them as they are. And finally, don't fear the mayhem. So thanks very much uh, for that. Uh, my information is here if you want to follow me on twitter or catch up with me on my website or drop me a line feel free always happy to hear and you can uh, see some, some of my output on smartsystematictrading.com and with that i will thank you very much for your attention with you good luck good trading and bye for now